Good evening. I'm a meteorologist. I'm not on TV. That's the first question people usually ask. What channel are you on? Another question they often ask is, is it going to rain tomorrow? And the third question I get is, hey, my daughter's getting married in four months. Outdoor reception. Is it going to rain? I don't know. I know the answer to those questions. But that's what we get as meteorologists. In fact, meteorologists do a lot of different things. How did I become a meteorologist? I noticed a lot of students and kids in the audience. I wanted to take one minute to tell that story because I hope it inspires some of the youth in the audience. I used to love catching insects in the yard. I used to go out in the yard when I was fourth grade, fifth grade, and just catch all kinds of insects, put them in jars, poke holes in them, and just watch them. I wanted to be an entomologist, study of insects. Something happened in the fifth grade. I was stung by a honeybee, and I almost died because I found out I was highly allergic to bee stings. This was pre-EpiPen days. And that stinging by a bee led me to a plan B because I had a science project coming up and I said, I need to do something. I don't want to mess with those bees. So I wanted to do something. So I decided to do a project on weather. And from that day forward, after doing my sixth grade project, can a sixth grader predict the weather? I knew that I wanted to be a meteorologist. And from sixth grade on, I made plans to be a meteorologist. Talk about translation and transformation. And that's what I wanted to do. And I didn't want to do the TV forecast thing. I was more interested in the R&D, the research and development. And so that leads me to the translation of a very important topic today in contemporary times. Take a look at this. This is data from NASA. I'm a former NASA scientist right down the road at Goddard Space Flight Center before going to the University of Georgia. And what you see here is satellite data and computer models that scientists at NASA have developed. I'm the chairman of NASA's Earth Science Advisory Committee, so I get privy to this really neat information. And what you're going to see, here comes Hurricane Harvey. Notice all the dust coming off of Africa. Notice all the wildfire smoke in California. But look at Harvey as it makes landfall in Tennessee. I'm sorry, in Texas. Four days in a row of nothing but rain. 50 inches of rain in a span of a week. A year's worth of rain almost within the span of a week. Here comes Irma and Jose on the heels of each other. Extreme weather events that impact society and impact life. Soon after that, you're going to notice Hurricane Maria. We all remember Maria, the impact on Puerto Rico, our fellow citizens, by the way. I really didn't say that for applause, but I appreciate the fact that we want to give props to those people down there because we knew it was coming. It wasn't a surprise. Meteorologists knew it was coming, and there you see Maria. And so the point I want to make and what... I want to deal with tonight is something called the weather gap. That's the idea I want to focus on. TED's about ideas. TEDx is about ideas. So I want to focus on the weather gap. Look at this headline. A year after Hurricane Harvey, Houston's poorest neighborhoods are slowest to recover. How do we live in a world where the color of our skin, our culture, or what side of the track we may have grown up on determines whether we suffer more from a hurricane or a heat wave or a snowstorm. That's what I want to deal with tonight. There's devastation from Hurricane Maria. People were without water and electricity for months. Consider that the next time, D.C., you get two inches of snow and lose power for an hour or two. And I make fun of that because I lived here in the D.C. area for eight months without power. Consider that. So what's this weather gap that you're talking about, Dr. Shepard? It's the simple notion that a disproportionate sensitivity to extreme weather events and a delay in the ability to bounce back from them. That's what we talk about with the weather gap. I mean, may, that may sound familiar to you, this weather gap 
There's something you often hear about called the wealth gap. That'll come into play in a moment. For example, black communities feel the pain of heat waves disproportionately because we tend to live in places that have more heat, and we also tend to live in cities that are vulnerable to the urban heat island. So that's a good example of what we talk about. Look at this map. That map shows us, based on census data, where primarily African American or black populations live in the United States. Clearly, we don't like northern climates. <laughs> Clearly. But the reality is, we live in the South, in the Mid-Atlantic. And these are places that disproportionately receive hurricanes, wildfires, heat waves, tornadoes, snowstorms. There are places in the U.S. that don't get all of those things. In the South and in the Mid-Atlantic, we experience all of those things. 2005, Hurricane Katrina devastated the population of New Orleans and the Gulf Coast states. Now, look at the date on that headline. I don't have my glasses on, but I believe it says August 29, 2016. I got a witness. That is 11 years later, yet Hurricane Katrina, black New Orleans, has not recovered. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. This is some of the scholarly research that I've done at the University of Georgia. Now, most of my research involves doing things like modeling hurricanes, predicting whether we're going to have extreme floods, but I ventured into this idea of vulnerability. And let's break down what vulnerability is. Exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. All right, let's, what does that mean? Let's say next week, D.C. has a big snowstorm. You get 20 inches of snow. That's not my prediction, by the way, so nobody tweet that. 20 inches of snow, the snowstorm, that's the exposure event. Everybody is exposed to it. Sensitivity. There are some people, some businesses that are more sensitive to the exposure than others. And then adaptive capacity, or what we call resiliency, means, okay, I'm sensitive to that snowstorm, but I'm able to bounce back from it. I've got a snowblower. I've got insurance if a tree falls on my house. That's what we mean by adaptive capacity. And so when we put these all together and when we think about certain parts of the population, there are some people that have higher vulnerability to weather events than others. So a recent report by the National Climate Assessment here in Washington, D.C. shows that older adults, children, communities of color, low-income communities are increasingly vulnerable to extreme weather, and I'm about to say it, climate change. So, you know, I could be riding the metro, chit-chatting with somebody on the metro, and I tell them I'm a climate scientist, and we do deal with skeptics. And so every now and then, a climate skeptic will say, well, hey, Dr. Shepard, you do know that the climate changes naturally. My friend Gerald in the audience, he deals with this with some of his colleagues. And I said, yes, I have a PhD in atmospheric sciences. <laughs> I didn't miss that. But the reality is, on top of our naturally varying climate system, we have a human steroid. Baseball players could hit home runs naturally, but when they use steroids, they hit longer ones and more of them. So there's nothing that suggests that a natural cycle cannot be modified by humans. Grass grows naturally, but when we fertilize the soil, doesn't it grow differently? Right? So, how do we close the weather gap? Again, Ted's about ideas, but Ted's also about solutions. So, here are my three ideas about how we close this weather gap. The first thing that we do to close the weather gap is erode the income gap. <laughs> Duh! We erode the income gap because when we erode the income gap, and here's, if you don't believe there's an income gap, there it is. All right, there's racial wealth equality, white, black, and Latino. 
Boy, there's a large gap between the blue and the orange and red. Good Lord. Okay, that's, so we got to get rid of the income gap because when we get rid of the income gap, then more people can withstand. I want to go back to that before I kind of go too far because look at those people in uh, Hurricane Katrina. Look at the faces that were at the Superdome relying on services. These were the low vulnerability population. These were the people that perhaps did not have insurance, did not have an extra car, did not have a, a fund that allowed them to go to Atlanta and stay in a hotel for a week. The income gap has to be eroded. We also have to understand these vulnerabilities in place, time, and economics, and then act. So tonight, by coming to this TEDx LaDroit Park event, you now, hopefully, if you didn't before, understand this concept of vulnerability. So perhaps you won't look at a hurricane, heat wave, or snowstorm the same. And so when we have this understanding of the vulnerabilities, we can act. Here's some research by my group at the University of Georgia. We found that African Americans were 44 to 80 percent more likely to reside in flood prone areas from the Charlotte to Atlanta corridor. That's not just in our region. When you look at those types of statistics, you can find that everywhere. So, that information allows policymakers, planners, and stakeholders to act. My friend Marlo is in the audience tonight, and she's a planner. And so we've been talking about ways that we can get the science over into the planning community. And the final way that we erode the weather gap is just increasing our weather and climate literacy. A lot of people don't realize that weather and climate are connected. Look at this. This is the trend in billion-dollar disasters in the United States over the last several decades. And you can see that in recent years, we are well above the average for billion-dollar weather events in a given year. So I want to close with a favorite statement of mine from one of Dr. King's most important works, his letter from Birmingham jail. He wasn't writing about hurricanes. He was writing about the challenges of his time. He said, moreover, I'm cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit by idly in Atlanta and not be concerned about what is happening in Birmingham. And justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all. That ties to weather and climate too. Thank you.